My name is Natalie uh, and I work for CMHA New Brunswick. It's a nationwide leader and champion for mental health. Um, and it really helps the community access resources that they need to build resilience and to support recovery for mental illness. Um, and through this whole uh, coronavirus that we've been going through, CMHA of New Brunswick has been really first out of the gate, uh, jumping to try to assist any way that we could. So we've been pro providing webinars the entire time and I hope you enjoy this one. So we have offices in Fredericton, Moncton and St. John. Fredericton is our provincial headquarters. Um, we have a large office in Moncton and another office in St. John. We have community education coordinators. And that's what I am. I'm a community education coordinator. Um, there are 11 of us and we're scattered throughout the province in the rural areas. So for example, I am based out of Miramichi and I cover zone seven. So throughout the entire province, uh, you can't escape us, we're everywhere. Um, certified peer support specialists, we have those. And we have an employment program working strong together in the Charlotte County area. So we know that people who are employed um, when they're living with a mental illness feel much better. They feel like they're able to contribute. So it's a wonderful thing. So today we're talking about and it's called an overview of mental health. So what is mental health? So mental health is far bigger than the absence of a mental illness. According to the World Health Organization, or WHO, the definition of mental health is as follows. Mental health is defined as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. So interestingly enough, the, one of the big differences between mental health and mental illness is every single one of us have mental health. We don't all have a mental illness. But even people with a mental illness have mental health. We're going to explore that a little bit as we get going. Um, so influences on our mental health. Resilience. Work-life balance. Positive attitude. Mindfulness. Self-esteem. And physical health. Um, I always find it interesting because we tend to separate mental health from physical health when health is health. Yes, things are treated a little bit differently, I agree, but there are many things that are similar. We're going to explore some of that too. So resilience. What is resilience? It's the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties and toughness. I like to uh, equate resiliency with like rubber, okay? We call it that bounce back factor. Resiliency allows us to bounce back from tough situations. Now, I'm not saying it happens overnight, but human beings are very resilient in that we're able to deal with a lot of tough circumstances throughout life and still come back to, quote unquote, our state of norm, okay? Not that I'm saying is normal, because normal is relative, but our state of norm, okay? So work-life balance. What is work-life balance? What is work-life balance? Is it simply leaving work? Um, work-life balance is going to be different for every single person because 
sometimes work is an escape, right? Sometimes life isn't easy and work is where we find relief. But it's gonna be different for every single person because some people enjoy working a whole lot and other people need more downtime. So work-life balance is going to be different for each individual. Um, and what about holistic balance? And I often compare us to like an octopus. And you know how an octopus has eight arms. And so maybe we're not an eight-armed octopus, but maybe we're a five-armed octopus. But each one of those arms need to be in balance. So we're talking spiritual, physical, emotional, mental, social. All of those areas of our life need to be in balance. We can't ignore one area of our life. And positive attitude. What is a positive attitude? You know, I used to work with somebody years ago and she very proudly would say, I'm a half empty kind of girl. It really isn't about half empty or full, but looking at the bright side of things, of, of finding a positive outlook. They say you can't live a positive life with a negative attitude. The question they ask is, is your glass half empty or half full? Yeah, that's, that's true. Somebody just typed to me really what, um, um, work-life balance is. Um, so how we answer the age-old question about half empty or half full, um, is really about positive thinking and how that positive thinking can reflect on your outlook of life, your attitudes towards yourself, whether you're optimistic or pessimistic, and it can even affect your health. Uh, positive thinking typically comes from optimism, which is a key part of effective stress management. And effective stress management is associated with many benefits. Positive thinking doesn't mean that you keep your head buried in the sand. It means that you look at approaching unpleasant things in a more positive and productive way. You think the best is going to happen rather than the worst. Positive thinking usually starts with self-talk. My goodness, have you ever had anything go wrong and you think, oh, how stupid can I get? We don't do that, do we? But it's changing that. It's, it's, um, it's changing. Instead of saying, how stupid was that? Oh. Well, that didn't turn out as well as I expected. Next time I will try. Is everything always going to go right? No, it isn't. But it isn't helpful to talk yourself down. Um, there's an endless stream of unspoken thoughts that run through your head. These automatic, automatic thoughts can be positive or negative. Some of self-talk comes from logic and reason. The other may come from misconception conceptions that we create due to a lack of information. If the thoughts that run through your head are mostly negative, then your outlook on life is mostly pessimistic. If your thoughts are usually positive, then you are most likely an optimist. So interesting to note, positive thinking can increase your lifespan. It can increase your lifespan. It can lower rates of depression. It can lower levels of distress. It can provide a greater resistance to the common cold. It can provide you better psychological and physical well being. It's reduced risk of death from cardiovascular disease and better coping skills during hardships and times of stress. So, the question to ask yourself is Am I a positive? or a negative self-talker. 
Some common forms of negative self-talking is filtering. So you magnify the negative aspects of a situation and filter all of our positive ones. Personalizing, so when something bad happens, you automatically blame yourself. Catastrophizing, uh, automatically anticipating the worst. You've seen people and everything's the worst case scenario, right? You're gonna go for a drive and you're gonna get a head-on car collision and everybody's gonna die. Catastrophizing. And polarizing, so you see things as only good or bad. There is no middle ground. But you can learn to turn negative thinking into positive. It takes time and it takes practice. You're creating a new habit. Here are some ways to make that happen. So identify areas to change. If you want to become more optimistic and engage in more positive thinking, first, identify areas of your life that you typically think negatively about. Uh, whether it's work or your daily commute, home or a relationship, start small by focusing on one area to approach in a more positive way. And you know what? I have a good example of that. Uh, I am located here in the Miramichi. And oh, just over a year ago, we got a traffic circle. Oh my goodness, this traffic circle. It did not give me a very positive attitude. Well, no, let me rephrase that. The traffic circle didn't do anything. It was just there. But as I watched people going through the traffic circle or not going through the traffic circle, whatever the case may be, oh, my attitude was terrible. And I had to give myself a stern talking to. And I had to change my outlook. I had to start looking at the positive. I can tell you today, traffic circle doesn't give me a bad attitude anymore. Traffic circle never gave me a bad attitude. I gave me a bad attitude about the traffic circle. But when I learned to change my thinking, it wasn't a big issue anymore. So check yourself periodically during the day. Stop and evaluate what you're thinking. Um, if you find that your thoughts are mainly negative, try to find a way to put a positive spin on them. Be open to humor. Give yourself permission to smile or laugh, especially during difficult times. Seek humor every day. When you can laugh at life, you feel less stressed. So follow a healthy lifestyle. Exercise at least three times a week uh, to positively affect mood and reduce stress. Follow a healthy diet to fuel your mind and body and learn techniques that work for you to manage stress. Now, nobody's saying you need to go join the gym and start weightlift training. But going for a walk is wonderful exercise. And if you feel impelled, compelled to go to the gym, you go for it. Uh, surround yourself with positive people. Make sure those in your life are positive. Supportive positive people um, give helpful advice and feedback. Negative people will make you doubt your ability to manage stress effectively and may increase your stress level. And practice positive self-talk. Follow one rule. Don't say anything to yourself that you wouldn't say to somebody else. Be gentle and encouraging with yourself. If a negative thought enters your mind, evaluate it rationally and respond with affirmations of what is good about you. So what is mindfulness? You don't know what mindfulness is? It's really being in the moment. Um, taking in what's around you removing your mind from the things that are troubling you. So it says, have you ever tried working on a project only to find your thoughts from all other areas of your life intruding in your mind, making it difficult, 
difficult to concentrate on the task at hand. This kind of distracted state can be debilitating. It might be a sign that you have ADD and could benefit from any number of treatment options or coping strategies. It might be a sign of other problems as well. But there's a very good chance that you've simply acquired too many open loops in your mind and you can get long lasting relief within the hour. So here's an activity, the clear mind procedure. Write down everything that's on your mind on one piece of paper. You can use more than one piece if you need to. Um, create three columns on a second piece of paper and label them. To be done, maybe later, and delete. Sort all of the items on the first piece of paper into three columns on the second piece of paper. Take each item from the delete column, send it off into space, tell it never to return. You can do a corny little ceremony if it helps. Um, if you guys would like that little activity sent to you, if you could send it to that info at cmhanb.ca, that would be perfect. So what is self-esteem? When we say we esteem something, what does that mean? It means we hold it in high regard, right? Um, we think highly of something. So if we put self in front of that, it means we view ourselves with esteem. Uh, Self-esteem is more than just seeing your good qualities. It is being able to see all of your abilities and weaknesses together, accepting them, and doing your best with what you have. Self-esteem means recognizing your unique talents and abilities and using that confidence to follow your goals and interests without comparing yourself to others. And there's another activity. And again, if, if you want that, make sure you send your email address and I will send you the activities, okay? Um, so this self-esteem act activity says, take a look at your good points. What do you do best? Where are your skills and interests? How would a friend describe you? Now, look at your weak points. What do you have difficulty doing? What makes you feel frustrated? Now, which list was easier to write? Remember that all of us have our positive and negative sides. We build confidence by developing our weaker areas and regularly reminding ourselves of the things that we're comfortable with and proud of. So what about self-worth? What's self-worth? It's believing that we have value. Worth is value. And once we build our lists and, and recognize our positive attributes, the things that we can esteem about ourselves, it gives us self-worth. So what is physical health? Yeah, it's, the, it's, it's our physical bodies and the health that goes with it, right? So how does our physical health affect our mental health? So the mind and body are connected. When we begin to improve our physical health, we begin to experience greater mental health. Exercise not only strengthens our heart and lungs, but it releases endorphins, powerful chemicals that energize us and lift our spirits. So here's a few tips. Get enough rest. To have good mental and emotional health, it's important to take care of your body. That includes getting enough sleep. Most people need seven to eight hours of sleep each night in order to function at, its, at their best. Learn about good nutrition. Not only learn it, but practice it. 
The subject of nutrition is complicated and not always easy to put into practice, but the more you learn about what you eat and how it affects your energy levels and mood, the better you will feel. And exercise. Exercise is an excellent treatment for mild to moderate anxiety and depression. To relieve stress and boost your mood, exercise is essential. Exercise is a powerful antidote to stress, anxiety, and depression. Look at the small ways you can increase activity in your day, like using the stairs, for example. To get the most benefits of exercise, aim for 30 minutes per day, every day. So an easy way to remember this is um, the RED theory, R-E-D. So rest, exercise, and diet. Those three components are essential for health, period, across the board, mental and physical, R-E-D. Another really good thing is sunshine. So the sun will lift our mood. Try to get at least 15 minutes of sunshine per day. This can be done while exercising, socializing, gardening, or doing other things. Even pulling your favorite chair close to a window and keeping the curtains open can be helpful. It's a good time of year to get out there. People are in their gardens starting to dig them up. It's a great time. So it's important to remember that everything is connected, okay? Everything is connected. Our mental health is connected to our physical health and our physical health is connected to our mental health and our emotional health is all connected to both and our so all of it everything is connected so mental health and stress that guy looks pretty stressed doesn't he so the deal is not all stress is bad some stress is good, but too much is bad. So mental health and stress are positively correlated when we have negative stress and we're unable to properly cope with that stress. It creates poor mental health. But as mentioned above, good stress does exist and it can create good mental health. Good stress in some situations can help motivate us to focus on a given task and take the actions required to problem solve. Stress is manageable. When it's stress is help manageable, it can be helpful. When individuals are experiencing unhelpful stress, people may become overwhelmed and feel like they are experienced, uh, can't solve problems. Um, it will lead them to avoidance of the original problem, creating a larger problem, and that will have negative effects on our mental health. And as people have a harder time concentrating, making decisions and feeling confident when faced with that stress, we just begin to feel totally overwhelmed. Um, some examples of positive stress are deadlines. Okay, not if you have too many deadlines, but the deadlines help us get a get things done. It get, helps us do our term papers. It helps us prepare for a test. It helps us meet goals. Uh, surprise birthday party. Totally stressful, but you get presents, so it's not a bad stress. Um, but when any stress, regardless of what it is, is repetitive and we get it too often, it can turn into bad stress. So what does stress look like? It's feelings of anxiousness, fear, uncertainty and impatience. We feel weighted down, always trying to play catch up. We get headaches, back aches, stomach aches. Our muscles tighten up and we get colds and flus constantly. We become short-tempered and absent-minded. We begin to overindulge in coffee, food, cigarettes, and alcohol and or drugs. At some point, we begin to experience health problems like diabetes and high blood pressure, ulcers and high cholesterol. 
when we deal with a change in our attitude, perhaps becoming more negative, we may experience insomnia. Once we reach this point, we have too much stress in our lives. It's not motivational anymore. It's a clear hazard to our health and well-being. It's important to know here that not everyone will have these symptoms. Stress affects everyone differently. Okay. So stress in our personal lives. Where do you think personal stress can come from? It can come from all of these financial relationship, change demands, control resources, aging parents, support, social and cultural. Finances is a big one, isn't it? We worry a lot today over finances. And for some people, it's not just long term financial, but just getting from pay to pay. That can be a huge stressor. Um, relationships with each partner uh, today under stress, sometimes we tend to take our frustrations out on those that we love and those that are closest to us. And we expect them to understand. Perhaps we need to stop and think that they have stressors of their own that they're trying to deal with. So change, change is difficult for most people. It can be change in a relationship, a child going off to university, a change in home environment, a change. We fear the unknown. And if we have a negative attitude, then the unknown is all we can focus on. So demands, as each day goes by, we seem to have more demands placed on us. Perhaps we need to evaluate to see where those demands are coming from. We tend to put a lot on ourselves and we tend to procrastinate. Why do we forget to be grateful for what we have and constantly be wanting what we don't have? We seem to have trouble being content today. Perhaps our children, for example. Do they have to be in two different sports and take music lessons? Not only is that very stressful for your child, but the organization and running around it takes to accomplish this creates stress. We have become so scheduled. And we, we don't feel like we're doing our jobs if Everything isn't so scheduled. Do you remember when I was young, and I'm a little older than probably most of you, we used to go outside and play. Do you remember what play is? Play is so great. It gives you coping skills. It teaches you how to problem solve. Play is a great educator. Uh, control. For people who tend to like control, we struggle today. It's rare when dealing with a long-term stressor. Do we have any control over it? it? Sometimes feels like things are more out of control than in. Maybe we need to take a step back, take a better look and ask ourselves, what is in my control and what is not? Remember the only thing you have 100% control over is you. So aging parents, today our parents are aging gracefully and want to remain as independent as possible. That puts an extra stress on you, especially if you are the child they depend on. Not only are you trying to take care of your children, your spouse and yourself, but also your parents. That's a big burden for one to carry. Perhaps delegation would be helpful. And support. We tend to want to do things ourselves and our burden can become quite large as the result. We need to establish a support system in our lives to help. Perhaps you may need a couple of different support systems, one for work and one for home example. You know, we're all born trying to become independent. Starts as a young child, and mom is trying to feed baby and baby pushes the spoon out of the way. I can do it myself. 
I don't need no help. I can do it. We we want to do it ourselves. We want to walk ourselves. We don't want to hold somebody's hand. We don't want to. We're born trying to be independent. It kind of irks us to have to ask for help. But you know what? It's okay to ask for help. We do not have to do it all ourselves. We can identify the problem. Is your job, school, or relationship with someone or worries about money causing stress? Are unimportant surface problems hiding deeper problems? Once you know what the real problem is, you can do something about it. And solve your problems as they come up. In the present moment, what can you do? And what are the possible outcomes? Would that be better or worse than doing nothing? Remember, sometimes solving a problem means doing the best you can, even if it isn't perfect, or asking for help. Once you've decided on a solution, divide the steps into manageable pieces and work on one piece at a time. Improving your problem solving skills is a long-term strategy that can help you feel like you're in control again. So talk about your problems. You might, may find it helpful to talk about your stress. Loved ones may not realize that you're having a hard time. Once they understand, they may be able to help in two different ways. First, they can just listen. Simply expressing your feelings um, can help a lot. Second, they may have some ideas to help you solve or deal with your problems. And if you need someone to talk with outside of your own circle of loved ones, your family doctor may be able to refer you to a counselor. Or you may have access to one through your school or workplace or faith community. So simplify your life. Good thing these are easy to understand French because I am very English, folks, just saying. Stress uh, can come up when there are too many things going on. Learning to say no is a real skill that takes practice. Try to look for ways to make your to-do list more manageable. Okay, we're gonna take a, a second here, and I know I can't hear you all, but go with me on this. Take a moment and practice. No. Do it again. No. Ooh, that feels pretty good, doesn't it? One more time for the good. No. Did you know that no is a complete answer? You don't even have to give it well unless it's your boss. But when other people are asking you stuff, it's okay to say no. Um, learn some helpful thinking strategies. The way you think about situations affects the way you respond to them. Unhelpful thoughts such as believing that everything must be perfect or expecting the worst possible outcome can make problems seem bigger than they really are. So learn about stress management. Um, there are many useful books, websites, and courses to help you cope with stress. There are also counselors who specialize in stress, and there may be stress management courses and workshops available through your community center, workplace, or school. And I'll just say, because I work for CMHA, we do a wonderful presentation on stress management, and there are a few of them booked coming up in the very near future. So if you go to the website or the Facebook page, you'll see some stress management courses if that interests you. Um, so start on the inside. Practices like yoga, uh, meditation, mindfulness, prayer, or breathing exercises can help you quiet your mind. Look at problems for calmer, more balanced point of view. With time, these practices can help you manage your response to a stressful situations as they come up. So we're gonna do a little exercise, okay? Everybody sit back in the chair with your back straight. 
Now, don't do this until I finish talking, but I want you to take a deep breath, deep enough that you feel it in your belly, okay? Not your shoulders, your belly. I want you to hold it for five seconds and release it. And then I want you to feel the difference in your shoulders and how much better they feel. Okay, you ready? Let's do it. You feel the difference? See how your shoulders went right down and they felt so much looser? That's one breath. If one breath can do that, learning how to breathe properly, what a difference that can make, huh? So get active. Physical activity can be a great way to reduce stress. Yeah, it does make you feel much calmer, doesn't it? Um, and improve your mood. Uh, activity can be anything from taking up a new sport to walking. The most important part is that you get moving and that you enjoy it. It shouldn't feel like a chore. If you experience barriers to physical activity, try talking to your doctor or care team for ideas. So for a lot of people, the beach is a very calming place, right? Did you know that walking in sand, because it's much more difficult to walk in loose sand, is a really effective all over exercise because it uses more parts of your body because you're kind of balancing and keeping your feet steady. It's a wonderful exercise just walking and in bare feet walking on sand. Ah, oh, the connection, it just feels wonderful on so many levels. I like the beach, so you know, that speaks to me. Um, and do something you enjoy. Um, making time for hobbies, sports, or activities that you find fun or that make you laugh can temporarily give you a break from problems. Listen to music, read, go for a walk, see a friend, watch your favorite movie, or do whatever makes you feel good. This can give you a little mental distance from problems when you can't deal with them right away. So one of the things that I love to do, not that it's all about me, but seeing as I'm the one who gets to talk right now, I guess it sort of is, um, I love to paint. Painting is a great release for me. Um, so I take a painting class. Can you see that? So I go once a month to painting class and it's about six hours. It totally is about me. I don't think about anything else except for this painting. We start with a blank canvas and we end up with something that isn't terrible. I'm just learning so it's not great, but it is something that and I'm sure all of you have something in your lives that kind of Calvon takes me away. It's up to you to find out what that is and utilize it for your benefit. So overall, wellness matters. Sleep eat well, relax, exercise, enjoyable, meaningful activities, and turn off your phone from time to time. So if we look at sleep, did you know that people who don't sleep enough die at younger ages? Even small amounts of sleep deprivation take a significant toll on our health. Listen, if you don't get enough sleep, you're pretty cranky, aren't you? I am. People don't like it when I don't get enough sleep. So it changes our mood, it changes our cognitive capacity and our productivity. Inadequate sleep decreases short-term memory and is associated with poor 
performance on newly learned or complex tasks. And it's also associated with decreased ability to maintain concentration. Most of us need between seven and nine hours a night. Only 2.5% of us need less than seven hours. That's one out of 40 people. So if you're not getting enough sleep, you need coffee to wake up or get going every morning. You have difficulty remaining focused for long periods of time. You feel irritable, irritable and or blue, and your memory is not as sharp as it used to be. So there are little things that we can do to increase our sleep. Turn your bedroom into a place where you sleep. Don't turn on the TV in your bedroom. Don't be looking at your phone in your bedroom. Only do restful, peaceful things in your bed. Don't fight with your spouse in your bedroom. Don't, your bedroom is just a place of rest and relaxation, intimacy, private time. Don't bring work. Don't, oh, for don't do work from your bed. Bed is for sleeping. So the eating well, eat regular meals. Sit down with a dietitian if you're looking for answers or have questions. Eat as healthily, healthfully as possible. Um, it's not always possible, but when you can, um, take a food label reading course, or there's all kinds of information online. I mean, you can seek out this information. Find out what works for you, what your body needs. Learn to relax, try new things, see what works for you. It might be yoga. I would find yoga very stressful, but for people who like it, they really like it. Maybe it is the walk on the beach. Maybe it is uh, vegging out. Maybe it's uh, spending time alone. Maybe spending time with friends. You know what works for you, what relaxes you. And get in that exercise. If you can possibly do 30 minutes a day, that's optimum. That's like, that's really good. Uh, and, you know, maybe it is something as simple as going for a walk. We don't all have to be uh, CrossFit trainers. Um, enjoyable activities, hang out with friends, joining a league or a team, social activities such as joining friends out for a coffee, maybe painting, like I said, or reading, and turn off that phone. Look, we are so connected to this little device. Oh my goodness. You, it's okay to leave it somewhere else. We don't have to be connected to it. So building mental wellness. We need to manage stress, exercise regularly, healthy diet. This sounds like a broken record, doesn't it? But these things are so important that we repeat them many times because they are so important. We have to learn to adapt to changes and deal with emotions, find inner peace, get enough sleep and relaxation, build positive relationships. Not all of our relationships are positive, but that's what we need. We need positive relationships. Develop a strong support network. Give and receive compliments. Get involved in your community, etc. Volunteer. Um, build strong workplace relationships with your supervisors and coworkers. It makes our job so much easier. Learn new skills. I, oh my goodness, I love learning new stuff. Uh, when I learn something new, it's like, oh, I didn't know that. It just gives me joy to learn new stuff. Um, learn our emotional intelligence. Find out what calms us. Um, talk about our feelings. Take a step back. Look at the situation objectively. Fill your glass. You ever hear the saying, you can't pour from an empty cup? Guess what? Can't pour from an empty cup. Fill up your cup. Find the things that fill you up. Fill your cup. It all leads to good mental health.
Why does the deep breathing calm you down so quickly? I think that's why she was... Oh, okay, gotcha. Because by nature, we tend to be shallow breathers. Just breathe for a minute and pay attention. Where are you breathing? You're breathing from your chest, right? When we stop and we draw the breath in, it makes us concentrate on that breath. Because in order to breathe from our belly, we have to think about that breath. When we're thinking about that breath, we're not thinking about the things that are bothering us. It is a very mindful exercise. Does that make sense? Be sure to go to uh, our website or the Facebook page or any of the webinars that you've missed. A lot of them are on the YouTube page. Again, if you want um, some of those activities sent to you, send your email to info at cmhanb.ca. They will forward me those emails and I will be pleased to send you out those two activities. I would really appreciate all your time today. Look forward to seeing you again sometime in the future. And you know what? COVID hasn't been all bad. We've gotten some great skills dealing with this. We can put them into our everyday life. Thank you very much for joining me.